The good folks at Comics for Fun and Profit have been doing two episodes a week um, for quite some time now, and it's all thanks to, first of all, Jason, and second of all, our patrons, who allow us to add the space on our server, broadcast more, store more, share more with you listeners. I'm envious of those of you who have unlimited storage and media server capabilities. We, we pay for ours here at, at the C4FAP. It ain't cheap. We thank you so much for those of you who go to patreon.com slash comicsfunprofit and contribute at any level to say thanks, to say I want to be a part of your Slack channel, conversations. I want to get exclusives. I want to get early access. I want to get ad-free access. I want to get swag. I want to get some free stuff. Whatever your reasoning is, we appreciate it at any level because it does make a difference. So from the bottom of Kyle and I and Jason's heart, thank you for contributing. Aloha. This is Jason from Hawaii. Welcome to a special edition of the Comics for Fun and Profit podcast. In this episode, I will be interviewing the creative team of the After Realm. Um, um, it is written by Michael Avon Omin, and it is colored by his wife, Taki Soma. They are here to promote um, the After Realm Kickstarter campaign, um, issue number five. Now, this campaign is underway, and it, if I got my information correctly, it'll end on October 2nd. I'm, I'm sorry, Mike, is that is that correct? Okay. Yes. Okay. That is 100% correct. Okay. All right. <laughs> Mike and Taki, welcome to Comics for Fun and Profit. How are you guys doing today? Uh, yeah, thanks for asking. We're doing all right. Yeah, it's a good day so far. Yeah, sunny <laughs> out, can't complain. <laughs> okay, all right. Off New Jersey, I can complain, but. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so um, listeners, I'm just going to give um, a brief history of um, Mike and Taki's um, work in comics. Now, Mike is an Eisner Award winner um, his series that he co-created with Brian Michael Bendis, Powers, won the 2001 Eisner Award for Best Series. Mike has co-written with um, Daniel Berman, a Thor, a Thor story arc, um, issues 80 to 86, and that was titled Ragnarok. And he also did a six-issue limited series, also, um, if I remember correctly, with Daniel, it's a six-issue limited series, Stormbreaker, the, the saga of Beta Ray Bill. Um, and also, too, he did the art. He he was the artist on Bulletproof Monk with writer Brett Lewis. Now, that is a feature film starring Chow Yun Fat. And I've seen the movie. I love that movie. That was great. It, it's a real fun movie. And, and also, of course, recently, um, he, he was the artist on the World of Krypton miniseries that just ended, I believe, a few a couple months ago or something like that. Yeah, yeah. 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 Now, also, to Taki, I'm going to go over um, Taki's um, comic book, um, Works in Comics. She's a writer, artist, colorist, and a Hugo Award nominee. She has worked on, um, as a, she has worked as a colorist on um, United States versus Murder, Inc., Dick Tracy. She has written Rapture and Synergy um, and was the artist on Ironheart and Bitch Planet. Um, and her most important and personal work today is Sleeping While Standing. Now, I'm going to ask Taki, may I ask for the listeners, can you um, explain what um, uh, what Sleeping While Standing is about? Oh, sure. Uh, it is about uh, my life. Uh, it's an autobiography and uh, they just kind of dip into different parts of my lifetime, uh, important parts, and I tell each story uh, in four pages or less. Mm -hmm. okay. And then I'm just asking if, if um, I'm, because I'm interested in getting a copy, where can I pick up a copy of this book? Uh, anywhere you can get a copy. Um, you know, a book or comics. So you can uh, order it through your comic shop or you can get it from, you know, Amazon or Barnes and Noble, or you can get it directly through the publisher, which is Avery Hill mm -hmm. uh, Publishing. Uh, so yeah, you can get it anywhere. Uh, you can order it through any, yeah, any channel that you can get a comic book or books from. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Now, Mike and Taki, did I miss anything or do you guys want to add 
anything, you know, do you guys want um, listeners to know, like, um, did I miss anything? Or is there anything you guys want to focus on any of your past works or? I think it's, I think, no, I think that's you, a good yeah, overview. You, co you covered all the, all the good juicy stuff. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Now, before we begin the interview, I want to give a big shout out to Taki for setting up this interview. Taki, thank you very much. Thank yes. You. Thank you very much. All right. Now, um, Mike, I'm going to start off with you. Where can listeners follow you on social media? Um, I'm on Twitter all the time. It's just at mm -hmm. Oming. Um, and uh, tw uh, Instagram as well is also at Oming. Mm -hmm. And um, I have a professional Facebook page. And I think that's Michael Avon Oming. Uh, okay. And you'll be able to put a little drawing icon of me on, on there. And I, I don't do TikTok or any of the other stuff. I'm too um, old. <laughs> <laughs> I tried to register and they were like, no, <laughs> I was rejected. Yeah, too old. <laughs> and then, Taki, what about uh, you? Uh, I'm on uh, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. I don't post much uh, at all, really, but I am present. Mm -hmm. And, you know, uh, I am there. Um, <laughs> and it's uh, all of them is Taki Soma. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. And I forgot to mention, I'm also on YouTube. And on my YouTube channel, I have a lot of uh, process videos and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. All right. I got to check that out, too. Okay. So, um, Mike, I'm going to start off this question with you. Where did you grow up? Um, I was born in El Paso, Texas, and off and on spent some time in Texas in my, in my youth. But but basically, I was really born and I was really raised in New Jersey, mm -hmm. uh, which is funny. There's a movie coming out. Uh, some indie film called uh, Funny Pictures or uh, Funny Books mm -hmm. um, about a kid, a poor kid in Trenton, New Jersey, breaking into comics. And right next to Trenton was where I grew up at. And some of my first earliest experiences were there. So it's, it's going to be funny to, 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 to watch that. But basically, I'm a Jersey boy. And then I, mm -hmm. yes. in my adult life, uh, moved out here to the Northwest. And this is where the new home is. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. No, but I'm going to say, yeah, I, that movie that you mentioned, I... I think I saw the trailer for that. It's yeah, like, it's like a real, like a real independent movie where yeah, super indie. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. We're excited to yeah, yeah, to watch that. I'm just excited to see anything that looks like where you grew up. You know how that is, right? It's like oh, all yes. the Trenton buildings and the row homes and stuff, and you know, uh, yeah, it, it makes your heart shine a little bit. And then Taki, what about you? Where did you grow up? Oh man, uh, I grew up in uh, Tokyo, Japan. Uh, I was born there. I lived there until I was nine, and then I moved to Minnesota. Read my book. It, it's all. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, I, I moved to Minnesota uh, in January of 1986. Oh my gosh, wow. it was so cold. I yes. <laughs> I can't believe I am still alive. <laughs> I, it was so cold um anyway so yeah I uh, so I was in Minnesota and um my, most of my formative years were spent there I, I lived there for 22 years mm -hmm. and then I moved to be with uh Mike um in Jersey uh mm -hmm. and we were there for like yeah, less yeah. than a year yeah. uh and then we moved to uh Pacific Northwest and uh yep yeah, it's mm -hmm. we're not at now Okay. Well, thank you very much. Now, um, Taki, um, what was or were your first comics? It could be the Sunday newspaper strips, manga that you read. Oh boy! I mean, when you when you're born uh, when you're born in Japan, mm -hmm. you know it like it's everywhere. Comics are everywhere. So I don't think I have any memory of like the first comic mm -hmm. yeah so i don't know no, okay. uh, but I, I will say like the the most um the one that i do have a, a you know strong memory of is probably drymon uh, which is like a robotic cat mm -hmm. uh, that uh, uh and like he can like time travel and he has all these gadgets that like um that he can pull up from his pocket from his uh -huh. belly like mm -hmm. yeah so Think that's what i remember the most uh, and what about you mike <clears throat> um when i moved back to texas in like the second grade or third grade i forget what grade it was 
I remember I, would, I couldn't assimilate very well because even though I was born in Texas, I was very much of a Northeastern snobby kind of kind of mindset. Mm -hmm. and I didn't get it, you know, and, and I couldn't assimilate at all. And um, I locked myself in my room, much like I do now. And uh, I discovered comics and mm -hmm. um, some of them were like these like these comics that just came in packets and it was like Sergeant yes. Rock and Hawk Ghost Bank and stuff. But when I came back from there and moved back to Jersey, um, I stopped at like a 7-Eleven and it was X-Men Annual number nine. These are some of the few comics I can mention by, by name because uh, it was Art Adams yes. and it was the X-Men going to um, Asgard. Yes. So obviously this this formed so much of what I wanted to be as a comic book artist was, was that and, X, and New Mutants Annual 2, which was sort of the second yes. part of those Art Adams drawing. Um, Mike Mignola was another huge influence on me, was one of the anchors on there, as well as um, Terry Austin, one of the greatest anchors of all time. And the, between the artwork and the subject matter, that cemented who I was going to be and what I wanted to do all at once. It was like an epiphany. Um, and there was no turning back from that. I was, mm -hmm. I was probably 12 at that point, mm -hmm. 13, something. Yeah. And also, too, for listeners, because um, that might correct me if I'm wrong, because so that X Men Annual Number Nine and New Mutants Number Two is not right. just only a part one and part two story of just the X Men, but they were. Um, but it also was like it dealt with mythology. It dealt with them in yeah. being in. Correct me if I'm Asgard. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I still have those two issues bagged. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. They, you know, I, those those were just so. Uh, formative because it wasn't just the art and it wasn't I was also just getting into superheroes and stuff like X-Men were cool and of course yeah. I, I I I really got into New Mutants because all the tricks worked on me and I didn't know what it was you know that mm -hmm. they were young they weren't really in power yet and all that and, and you feel that as a kid you don't feel empowered yet you know mm -hmm. um, so all of those elements were there but then there was also the curiosity of like here was Thor's hammer you know, and then the mention of these other gods and these places where like Loki was on top of this mountain where you could see everything throughout the, the realms and what are the nine realms and stuff mm -hmm. like that. And through that, getting um, then when I would pick up cues and other media about Thor or mythology and I realized, oh, this is a thing. This is like Greek mythology, which was mm -hmm. my first love as a, as a kid. Before I understood anything about superheroes or anything, I'd go to the school library when we'd have to go and. I would just go right to mythology stuff, right to Greek mythology. So mm -hmm. I was primed for superheroes and mythology as, as an early age. And this particular book, these these books, just it all came together. Like all of these elements came together to just mold me. If I have an origin story, it would probably have to just be those those comics because it, it branches out so many different areas from from that point. Yes. Oh, yes. And um, because also, too, um, on a larger scale, because those those two annuals, also it was part of a huger story of, oh God, I'm going blank. It's um, the Asgardian Wars, the mm -hmm. yeah. Alpha Flight. Yeah, yeah, and and then I went back and I got that, which I remember that was um, Paul uh, Paul Smith's work, yes. um, and that's when you know imagine trying to read those and not really knowing who the X Men were. Mm -hmm. It was insane. I couldn't understand anything that was going on. And I was completely fascinated. Like when Warlock shows up. Yes. You know, I didn't understand that he was like this creep, this alien creature who was basically made out of broken magnets and they mm -hmm. could just shape change and stuff. So I didn't know what the F was going on when like suddenly he turns into the Enterprise at one point and like <laughs> he's holding on to other people. Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't know Sunspot, his character at all but i was fascinated by he would just turn black like us like a sunspot with yes. these crackles around him and he gets super strong and you know um you know magma just being obviously made in magma and stuff mm -hmm. like something obvious like wolverine is so obvious and iconic even before you know who he is you kind of get immediately who he is yes um, and it's a real testament to not only the characters but you know claremont's writing at the time mm -hmm. To not understand anything and to still be hooked into it, um, everything was just firing on all, all pistons. There was stuff subliminally going on, iconology that, mm -hmm. that subconsciously, but you were just grasped onto and, and sucked into. Um, yeah, and there was just so much going on in there. I could just talk about those books and, and that story arc and everything for hours because it just opened up so much for me. 
oh yes yes and um <laughs> and as soon as you mentioned you know those two annuals going it's like oh now i can understand where that sort of that where some of the influence of the after realm may have come from absolutely yeah so okay um now talking i'm, I'm gonna ask you um you know um Actually, no, Mike, I'm going to go back to you um, because we're already talking about mythology. May I ask, like, what, well, you already talked about, you know, when you go to the library, you, you gravitated to the mythology section. Like, you know, like, um, what books did you read from the mythology section? Did you, like, read Homer? Um, no, nothing, nothing heavy like that. You know, I, I grew up in a house where um, uh it was a disabled household. We, my, my, I was raised basically by my aunt and uncle. We're both legally blind, mm -hmm. um, so there wasn't a lot of reading going on in the house. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of it was like the picture books, right? Mm -hmm. And obviously, at that point, I had seen Clash of the Titans and Star mm -hmm. Wars had been a, a huge influence as well. Mm -hmm. um, I just didn't even know what to look for. I didn't know that I was into mythology. Like even when I would, I would make a beeline to those sections i didn't know consciously that that's what i was even doing i was looking at mm -hmm. dinosaur books and anything with greek mythology pictures in it um yes. and then in a way it was good that i wasn't actually reading that stuff like like deeply i think mm -hmm. instead my my own imagination had to kick in and tell me what the pictures were about mm -hmm. why was there the head with snakes on it why was there a horse with wings on it how does mm -hmm. that work like mm -hmm. so Instead of any of it being explained to me, I had to make it all up in my head. Yes. Um, it wasn't until later as I grew up that I actually started reading uh, some of this stuff. Mo mostly through Joseph Campbell studies, to be honest. Oh, okay. All right. Now, Taki, I'm going to ask, you know, did, mm -hmm. did you read any books about, like, mythology, whether it's um, Western myth um, or Greek mythology or Japanese mythology? Did you read any of those while growing Not up? Not a whole lot. No, not really. I just not really that into like history much. <laughs> so, like, yeah, I consumed as much as I was forced to consume, but yeah. You were a sci hardcore science fiction early on. Yeah. Uh, oh. So yeah, I, I'm a, I grew up on sci-fi. Sci so yeah. Like, okay. yeah. Oh, history, it's, it's already happened. <laughs> 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 Let's look forward. <laughs> All right, Taki, off the cuff question because since you're a sci uh, hardcore sci fi fan, you know, like, what are some of the sci fi books have you read, the novels and stuff? Well, I always uh, bring up Ford Rainer Smith. Um, he is a, uh, a very unique sci, -sci fi writer who's uh, unfortunately is a, you know, a forgotten writer, but he was an important writer. He's, there's an, uh, an award named after him for any um, new sci-fi writers uh, who comes up with like a, a really unique idea. Mm -hmm. So um, he was just a really unique sci-fi writer. And um, he has a, had a really interesting um, life. As far as I know, um, he's actually the writer of, um, psychological warfare um okay. yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. It, it's it really interesting but uh Corbino Smith um he did a lot of like um short stories so mm -hmm. currently uh in print um there's like a collection of all of his short stories um in somewhat of a chronological order because even though they're short stories they're they're kind of like intertwined like a, oh, a big okay. long yeah. like three four thousand year saga Mm -hmm. um, it's collected and it's called uh, uh, something of man um, shoot um, no, I can't remember it in, oh. in this moment um, oh. yeah um, instrumentality for mankind oh okay <laughs> so, uh, I, I always uh, suggest anyone who's like a hardcore uh, sci-fi reader to check that out yeah, any, any of the trippier comics writers mm -hmm. uh, who are known for like, you know, outlandish stuff, it makes them look really prosaic. Like it's that, it's that insane. Like I'll read some of these books or talk and start reading to me and it, it, and I feel like I'm having a seizure, like, like an imagination seizure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And currently like, you know, like modern uh, sci-fi uh, writers, like I am really into um, John Scalzi. Okay. Uh, 
Yeah, he did the uh, Old Man's War series, and oh, it's so good. Mm-hmm. Ah, okay. I have to check out some of those books. I really do. Thank you very much for those recommendations. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah. Mm-hmm. All right. Um, Taki, I'm going to um, start off with you on this question. Um, do you remember your first comic book shop that you went to? Whether it was in Japan or in Minnesota or even in... Well, Georgia. if it was... if I mean, Japan, I mean, comic books are everywhere, so right. we won't count that. Um, but uh, my first actual comic shop um, was in Minnesota. And I want to say... I don't remember the name. Oh, that's fine. But somewhere in Minneapolis. Yeah. I'll tell you. <laughs> yeah. That's no problem. Uh, Mike, what about you? Um, for me, there's just kind of three I'll, I'll mention really quick. One was the very, very first comic book store that I walked into, and I think it was called Pyramid Comics, and that was in Trenton. But I have hardly any real memory of it. Um, Thunder Road Comics, which was in Burlington County, was super important. That's really where I, I first started going to, to get comics. My mom would go get them for me. Mm-hmm. And it's also where I met uh, this other comic book artist you might have heard of, uh, Adam Hughes. He was working there behind the counter. <laughs> I haven't uh, heard of him. <laughs> yeah. So this is obviously this is before he had broken in. And, you know, we we started up a friendship, you know, based around our art and stuff. And um, uh, yeah, he just introduced me. He's like my my my, my nerd sensei. Like he just taught me. He injured, I mean, he showed me Blade Runner. He introduced me to Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy and Lord of the Rings, all of these things. Um, and, and we had met at that store and he was just, he was like drawing signs for the store and stuff like that. And, and shortly after that was when he was like trying out for gigs and stuff. So obviously that store me, meant a lot to me was was uh, was Thunder Road in Burlington. And then my main store for the very longest time was called Steve's Comic Relief, which was like a chain in, in Jersey. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's where I would find all my own books and really mold it myself, and my own tastes and stuff. Thank you for sharing that story. That is so cool that you know, you met Adam Hughes before, you know, I'm, while he was working in a comic store before, and you know, we we met each other before we were anything. We just like you know, nerdy outcast kids, you know, spending a lot of time by ourselves and drawing and you know, learning from each other and stuff. And it was just the, some of the the best times. Oh, that is so great. Thank you. thank you very much. That is so cool. Thank you very much. Um. Taki, I'm going to ask, how did you, um, how did your journey started working in comics? Oh, um, I, well, I was going to school for um, advertising. And oh. uh, one day a, a friend of mine from school was like, you know, I don't mean to be mean, but I don't really think you belong in the ad world. And I'm like, oh, thank you. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and he's like, no really I you talk about comics all the time uh, I'm just saying I don't know if you'll be happy in ad in the mm-hmm. ad world oh you know what you're right and I think literally in the next day I dropped out and I started pursuing comics and uh yeah and I, I was like I don't know how to do this but I'm just gonna start and that's how I started <laughs> oh that no but but hey, for your friend to literally be really upfront and honest. Yeah. Because, because if yeah. no one had told you, I'm just saying, if no one had said anything to you, yeah. you'd be doing advertising and stuff going, okay, yeah, all right. Yeah. yeah. You know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So I, I'm really, really grateful that yeah. he pointed that out to me because he was right. Like, that's all I did. But like, we talked about comics and hey talking how are you doing well i just read <laughs> you know whatever and boy did i love this and that and he's just like yeah but the assignment from yet yeah, okay never mind <laughs> 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 so yeah no he 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 totally got me i'm really grateful and um I, i'm i'm glad that i that that happened yeah and obviously he did it in a loving way it wasn't oh, some yeah. like gatekeeping way or like i've got to like you know put you through this fire test to see if you really want to be here i hate that kind of attitude oh yeah you know? no, um good person who just realized you know you just yeah you yeah. clearly you love this more than that yeah. Yeah. yes yeah and then um mike already you you start to mention about you know 
you started to draw. And how did how did you get into how did you start in comics? Uh, with tracing, you know, I was I was so fascinated by these comics when I was first getting them in Texas. Um, and I remembered as a kid, I'd always drawn a little bit, and it was something that yes. other people had pointed out that I was fairly good at. And then one day somebody didn't like my drawing, so I just stopped, you know, that kind of story. Yeah. Um, yes. but, uh, but when I got these comics and it was like, this while I was still in Texas, this is pre, um, pre-discovering pre X-Men Annual 9 and all that. Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. with, uh, some Web of, Web of Spider-Man and Peter Parker's uh, comics. Mm -hmm. They were, I think the ones drawn by like Rich Buckler at the time. Mm -hmm. and, um, I had tracing paper and I just started tracing. Yes. Mm -hmm. Just started tracing. I was just fascinated by it, and through the the tracing, slowly became drawing, which slowly became drawing and inking. Mm -hmm. um, and because I had known some um, aspiring comic book artists just by going to these comic book stores, like Adam, there were, there were other artists who didn't necessarily make it in the industry, but they knew what they were doing. You know, mm -hmm. they were they had skills, and uh, we'd all get together and talk about comics, and they teach me. This is how you ink and you use this thing as a repeatograph. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of that also goes back to, I was, I was lucky there were the, all these seeds early on um, in mm -hmm. my childhood that led to that. Like my mother, uh, um, she would, she didn't live with me for a long time when I was younger because she was an alcoholic and she was fighting that stuff. Mm -hmm. She eventually beat it and got custody back me and all that happy story. Mm -hmm. But she would rip, send me letters with drawings in them. So like that, the drawings was something that I would, be attached to uh -huh. and I had a cousin and I remember him once showing me how he would draw and he had this trick he said look this is what I do first I, I'll draw it in pencil uh -huh. and then I take a pen and yeah. then I draw over it and then I erase the pencil uh -huh. yeah so it just looks like it's drawn in pen and like I didn't know that what was inking I don't think he knew that was inking or anything um as my cousin Joey so like it, you know these little seeds that sort of led up this this larger blossoming of this is what I wanted to do. I think that's why when I saw those comics, mm -hmm. why it hit so hard, there was already some uh, foundational influences around me that I wasn't aware of. Yes. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. but, that, but that's it. From that moment on, I neglected everything else in my life. Uh, like I, I, I did sports shortly mm -hmm. and then I realized how much energy sports was taking away from drawing. So I quit that. Mm -hmm. I, would, I would cut school to stay mm -hmm. home and draw or stay up all night and drawing. Mm -hmm. I didn't go to parties. I didn't date. I, I was just obsessed. Like mm -hmm. just, and you, you'd think for all that drive, I'd be much better than I am today. <laughs> oh my God. That's what, what I always think about. It's like, oh my God, if I didn't try this hard, I'd mm -hmm. suck it more. <laughs> <laughs> I get by, I do fine. <laughs> well, the crazy thing is um, at his age, you would think he's, you know, reached his peak of his performance. Mm -hmm. Um, a while ago, but I see his improvement year every year. It's crazy, mm -hmm. and I'm I'm in awe. And no, I'm you know. Well, we yeah. learn we learn a lot from each other, and yeah. that's one of the, the the things that I love most about about our about our relationship and our marriage is is um we're such a like the way you see us right now in this panel, yes. like as we're doing Zoom. That's basically how we spend our life, and like. You know, we learn so much from each other as we grow as artists and writers. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, we support it each other. We depend on each other. And yeah, yeah we, uh, we trust each other. It's, yes. Yeah, so it's it's been pretty great. Yeah. Um, yeah. 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 Wow. That's, <laughs> no, no, that's nice. Just thank you very much for sharing that. Thank you very much. Yeah, just thank you very much. Yeah. And I'm going to say that is the perfect segue because we're going to talk about the after realm now um let me i'm going to read a couple quotes um it was from it was on issue number three now, and this is part of a quote from newsorama.com quote a flat out fun story that's accessible for fans of any fantasy realm now another quote from comicbook.com all means art is at its finest in the comic, in part due to Takisoma's epic colors. Um, now, before you guys say anything, listeners, I'm gonna say because I've read all four, I have four, all four issues and I've read it. And it, you know, this series is great. Wow. Newsorama has put it correctly that the story is accessible. Um, now, Mike, please don't, don't, 
don't take this the wrong way because you know I, I read any kind of comics basically you know and I'll and I'll read like um sometimes I'll read Conan comics and I'll be honest with you sometimes it, it gets me a, like a few pages for me to really get into the Conan the Conan story or or like um when they start to do Thor and he starts doing that uh the whatever his um as guardian shakespeare right. speech and, and, and yeah me a little while to get to it you know but you know for listeners you know um when i read the first scene i mean literally um to me the second page of the first issue just hooked me in the mm. dialogue is natural you know um um it 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 it, it just flows very smoothly you okay. know and it's, you know, it's, um, yeah, it just, and it, it just feels natural. It's very, it flows very smoothly. Um, and, and, you know, you know, that's what I loved about it. And it just grabbed me in real quickly. Wow. Well, you thank know? you. I really, really appreciate that. And, and, and I'm not making, I'm not making this up, you know, because, and it's held my, and, you know, I've read all four issues and I love it. Um, um, yeah, and I, I don't know. I lost my train of thought. But anyway, but, <laughs> but I also wanted to add to um, Taki, your colors. I love your colors. You Thank know, you. I love it where you can, you know, the bright, the bright, strong. I, I, now, I'm not an artist or a color, so I'm going to get probably get things jumbled up or say the wrong things. But but your colors in the foreground are very bright and very strong because yeah. you can distinct it from the background. And I love um the first issue the second page if i remember correctly the second page is um i, I there's like a, um some type of town or city i can't remember some type of town yeah. huh? i yeah. love that because you know taki you're you know the artwork is really good but taki mm -hmm. what i loved was that your colors you know you highlight certain buildings it's not all faded in the background because you know yeah. you can see the color strong in in the foreground and then in the like the mid ground area, like you said, you color some of the 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 houses, you know, really strong. It stands out. It's very good. Yeah. Um, Mike, I love your art. Um, and um, I really can see the influence of Mike Mignola's um, style in there. It is yeah. your no, it is your own. But you know, I but I it it, it sure. it's perfect for this series. It is. Thanks, thanks. Yeah. I mean, Mike, along with Art Adams, like I was a fan of Mignola's stuff. Um, honestly, I was a fan of anybody's work who who was outside of. I don't mean to be critical of, of this, but like by the time I was reading comics in the mid and and late eighties, yeah. the Marvel house style had become pretty washed out. There was yeah. a lot of imitations of imitations, mm -hmm. um, and still solid stuff, but just lacking in like a flair to it. So, yeah. like anybody like a Rick Leonardi. Early Mike Mignola, Art Adams, Michael Golden, like anybody who just kind of stuck outside of that. Yes. Um, it struck me. Yeah. yeah. And, and Mignola, even way before he turned into the Mignola we know now, had just the most interesting stuff, you know. Um, mm -hmm. So I was always, always like, I kind of considered him like my school that I went to, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, so yeah, I'm always proud to have those influences uh, uh, showing through the work. Mm -hmm. All right. Now, Mike, we're gonna we're gonna start jumping in because um because we I, I want the new read you know for new listeners and new readers to kind of know what the, um at least the after realm um storyline is about. So like for new readers, what is the after realm about? I know, you know that sounded I've, kind of weird when I asked that question again, but hey, I think you know what I mean. <laughs> uh, you know, I've I've spent a lot of time um at Marvel and and pre Marvel I, I did a series called uh, Hammer of the Gods, which was um, a Norse mythology comic. And um, and then obviously working in at, at Marvel on, on a couple of Thor titles and actually doing Ragnarok, I had always had thoughts about, well, what happens afterwards? And and there are yes. some written accounts with different characters, but it, it doesn't get very deep. So it's a pretty wide open world. And um, I think it was around 2012 or so, um, I had been working at this video game company called Valve, uh, where we were doing like Left 4 Dead and, and Half-Life and... Um, uh, Team Fortress and stuff, and I was looking to to do another creator-owned comic. It had been a while because I was working at the stores or at the 
that company. So it was mostly working that, there and, and working on powers. Mm-hmm. And it had been a while since I had done something. So I was like, let me just, and I was taking advice from my buddy, David Mack, who, who would talk yes. about returning to your roots. What were the earliest things that, that influenced you? And I was thinking about this, this, the fantasy ideas that I, that I had in my head as a kid and elves were part of that. So it started there. Um, and early on, it was very different. It was going to be much more heavy metal, like, you know, like really kind of gonzo and, you know, through a male gaze kind of stuff. And I was just going to embrace all of that and, um, you know, go pretty crazy with it. Um, and just as time went by, it, it started to evolve. Mm-hmm. Um, glad the story came together because honestly, the stories that you read in the first few issues are not the stories that I intended to tell. Mm-hmm. I intended it to start kind of around where issue three starts. Mm-hmm. Yes. Whereas this, all this stuff with, with, with Una as a child came from another opportunity. Um, it was, it's just, it was a startup company that was going to do like a webtoons kind of thing, like an infinite mm-hmm. scroll. And um, I took the opportunity. I leapt into it and then the deal fell apart. I'm so, I'm too fast for my own good sometimes. So I had finished a huge chunk of the story before the contracts came through. And then things fell apart. So there I was getting ready to do this thing. And then now I had this whole other story. Mm-hmm. And now instead of like the heavy metal kind of aspect of it, I've introduced them as, as young kids. And I was like, all right, now I have to rethink this as this, this has to be PG, PG 13, mm-hmm. you know, for, for a little bit of violence and that's it. Yes. And I embraced that and, and figured out a way to put them together. So I'm glad it all, it all works out. Yes. Um, the, the general story, and then we get to the point for people, is uh, my, my fascination with, with Ragnarok and what happens afterwards. I want to, in my mind, when Ragnarok happens, it kind of ties into, a, again, early stuff. Like all of, all of Ash Realm turns into, ties into my, my early life. And uh, I, I went to school um, and Sunday school and went to church as a kid. Mm-hmm. Um, and like all Christians, you're, you're, you think that God is going to come after you and, and judge you and destroy you and turn the world into fire. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I had these early imaginations of like the end of time yes. happening to everybody at the same time, that everybody was going to be judged at the same time from all cultures all around the world and stuff. I, you know, for some reason in my head, time wouldn't matter at the end of time. Yeah. So that ties into this was basically when Ragnarok happens for for the Asgardians, the end of the world happens for everybody, whether it's mm-hmm. the Yuga, whether it's the Mayan calendars, whether it's a Christian version, whether it's a pagan version, there's mm-hmm. all these, the, the gods will die or, mm-hmm. you know, time will come to an end. Mm-hmm. So I wanted to have this, this small group of elves have this pocket universe where they retreat into this pocket world when everything falls apart. Thousands of years later, they begin to train a small amount of rangers to go out and remap what has become of all of the realms mm-hmm. find out well what happened to the gods when they died and are there new gods coming up um so it's it's the idea is una and some other rangers are going out into this decimated reality where time and space are no longer have any meaning and sh- they're trying to just map out and then they find like in the first their her first encounter is with odin what happens to odin mm-hmm. odin's body is 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 he's, he gets He's killed and he is uh, eaten up by these worms. And then the worms evolve over thousands of years to be like, have shadows or echoes of, of Odin in him. And, and he kind of remembers through these maggots, these giant, you know. Yes, I love the maggots. Maggot, sorry. I God, that he kind of remembers that he's Odin, you know. <laughs> so it's these kind of things, rediscovering the gods and rediscovering and remapping uh, mythology. And there's some larger story arcs in there that, I'm going to start to sort of work into shorter stories as, as we go into the future. Mm-hmm. Um, but the idea is just let's rediscover mythology. Let's rethink about what all these symbols mean all from around the world and, mm-hmm. um, and explore that. And, mm-hmm. and that, that's largely what that's about. Now, um, Taki, you know, um, what was your reaction when Mike told you this story? I said, get out of here. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, you know, I, I, I thought to myself, like, well, I like elves. I like um, fantasy. I mm-hmm. think this would be really, really fun. You know, um, he basically was like, well, I, I really want 
I just want to have fun with it. My yes. Yeah. That's that's the best motivation in my mind. So yeah, let's just go go with it. And uh, yeah, if you need a colorist, I can color it. Yeah. Aki's such as you were talking about her colors earlier. She's not just aesthetically a pleasing colorist, but she tells story with coloring. Mm -hmm. uh, that includes editing. Like what 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 is the eye drawn to and not drawn to in my art to to further tell the story. Yes. Um, that's one of the reasons why I love working with her was, was she was able to not just help me with the story be behind the scenes, but actually physically on the page. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Thanks. Yeah. I do my best. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but no, but my thanks for now. Thank you for you know sharing that with me and and, and Taki, don't take this the wrong way because I mean, you know, whenever I see the creative team of like inker and colorists they're like okay colorist is someone just they put the colors in but mike like you like you explained more it's you know it's they're telling the story too yeah yeah, yeah. like oh my you know so that, that's <laughs> no and, it, and i'm and i'm embarrassedly to say that after nearly some 50 years i finally learned you know what really you know the strength of a colorist is and how important well, then a lot of, you're, you're you're not supposed to notice you know it's kind of like cinematography in a film like it, it needs to to just be there and to, to pull you in but when it calls attention to itself you know then it becomes like i don't know like a michael bay film or something <laughs> or, or that's almost bigger than anything else you know mm -hmm. um and yeah just like the artist needs to know not to draw over the the word balloon space you got to make sure as you're drawing it you're respecting the space of the other people and stuff and yeah. writers looking out to not overrate stuff so that there's mm -hmm. space for shine and you know mm -hmm. we got to think about the colorists and the colors think about how best to make their work um perfectly melded and, and married with the artwork mm -hmm. yes yeah yeah now talking another question i'm going to ask you know did you you know um did you contribute any japanese mythology into the story because I've already read the first four issues. I know we talk about the Nine Realms. Um, I want to, uh, Mike, correct me if I'm wrong. I think I want to say issue three or issue four. I, I don't know if you start to introduce a little bit different mythologies into it. Yeah. You know. Yeah, there's there's a small spirit animal, uh, Nikomo, I believe his name is, um, which was like a, a tree spirit. Um, but we only see him for a little bit. Uh, he, he, most of these characters that we introduce, but we'll see again in, in future stories. Um, uh, right now, that that's that's as far as I've gotten because this, this this I'm telling this main story before I look forward yeah. to be able to jump around and tell a bunch of other other stuff. Yeah, I, I yeah, like I said, I I know the basics of like Japanese um, folklore and mythology, um, uh, but I'm not really well versed in them. So like he knows what I know stuff like that but i don't know if anything was influenced into that story you know really well i, I wouldn't say mythology wise but you know one of the one of the greatest comics of all time you introduced me to um that um, my brain is oh, which with, one? with the, the one-eyed kid and his father oh, um, uh, Gigi no yeah um that is so full of of mythological imagery mm -hmm. and Gigi no Taro is about like this this kid who's He's, 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 he's half yokai. Uh, if you know, if, uh, yokai is basically a spirit. Okay. Um, uh, good or bad, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, so this kid is like half uh, yokai, half human, and he's, his eyeball is his uh, father. Mm -hmm. he, can, he can pop his eye, eye out and it has a little tiny body underneath it, and that's his father. Yeah. And um, yeah, and he just lives in this. Uh, uh, world where like yokai world and uh human world is open to him and okay. so he can jump back and yeah. forth uh and uh yeah and while that story is not straight mythology it's obviously influenced by the mythology and that that yeah. influenced me as well because of like that's a very elf like your fairy like character sort of in between worlds yeah. and then the thing reminds me of odin odin loses his eyes sacrifices it for knowledge so i have imagery of that that'll tie into it as well um but the more as we we get down the line and i'm, and I'm also being really careful about like how I, I pick and tell these stories you know from other cultures and stuff to just mm -hmm. not only just be respectful but just make sure i'm getting the facts right and you oh, know yes. 
yeah. uh, answer anything I have to answer for after it's published and all of that, you know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> all right. Now, um, Mike, I'm going to ask, you know, for our listeners, can you at least, you know, like who are some of your main characters in the story? You've already mentioned Una? Una? Oh, okay. Yeah. I got that correct. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Una's the, the, the main character. Um, her so much of this comic comes from because I went back to the, the roots of things. I keep looking back at the things that that formulated me as a person and as an artist and infusing them into the story, um, which gives me great relief to hear that you can relate to the story because I'm not writing this the way I wrote for Marvel or or mm -hmm. when I wrote for or any of that stuff. Um, I'm literally just writing it for me, and I'm not sure when things make sense. Like I have a I have a, a, a relative who passed, my, my Aunt Carol helped raise me. She shows up as a spirit guide. Yes. At a certain point. And I'm like, I don't, you know, she's got her bingo cup and she's smoking a cigarette. Yes. And she's on her horse with no name. because That was her favorite song from a James Taylor song. And like, I'm infusing it, all of this stuff into there. So, so Una. Almost quite literally. Yeah. 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 Um, well, actually, at her funeral, that's what we buried. We buried her in her uh, bingo shirt and some cigarettes and a coffee cup and you know, yeah. so now she's back here in the comic, you mm -hmm. know, guiding my character. Um, and Una's name comes from one of my favorite fantasy films, which was uh, Legend, Ridley Scott. The main fairy character was, was Una, who steals a kiss from Tom Cruise at one point. And yes. she's a mm -hmm. maker, you know, so that that was all fitting. Yeah. Um, and the last name Lightfoot, as a, a, a huge influence on me, was the singer-songwriter stuff in the 70s. Like, growing up, there was... My, I, I grew up in a disabled household. They were legally blind, my aunt and uncle. Um, so music was constantly, constantly on. Mm -hmm. And there's always like folk music and Motown and a lot of singer songwriter stuff. Mm -hmm. So more than films or television, music and the words in music influenced me. Um, Gordon Lightfoot was a huge influence. All of his songs were stories, you know, whether mm -hmm. it's the record, it's Gerald, it's Sundown, or um, uh, if you can read my mind, all of that stuff. So that seemed fitting as well as it's a character kind of like Luke Skywalker, who is, is he's a traveler of the spirit, right? Mm -hmm. with, with a light foot, it just seems perfect. So that's that's kind of where her name came from, um, as well as all of those influences. Um, her character, her sidekick, this this goat who is magically um, compelled to protect her, mm -hmm. uh, his name is Puka, that comes right out of old Celtic mythology. Mm -hmm. Also, one of my favorite, favorite books of all time, it was a, a book of fairy drawings by Alan Lee and Brian Froud. Mm -hmm. And in that book, and then they, you know, Brian Froud designed all the, the Dark Crystal stuff, which was a huge influence again from my childhood. Mm -hmm. Alan Lee does all of the, the classic Lord of the Rings work. Mm -hmm. And there was a drawing of this Puka character, which is a goat man, uh, this man with a goat head, uh, always always stuck with me it just it just seared itself into my mind so that's where he comes from and he's a sort of he's a helpful chaos character so he, yes. he has magical powers that will help her but he usually screws it up <laughs> <laughs> he means well yeah uh, so the two of them have a lot of great banter the decks to each other there's a cast of other elves that yes. will come and go through the stories um there is uh um the the villain character um Thornbrack, I I think he just he just sort of evolved out of a lot of mythological imagery around trees. Mm -hmm. Um yes. which then informed me about the story, the ultimate story of where all of this is going, what the ultimate threat was going to be, mm -hmm. uh, which I don't want to give away too much of yet. Mm -hmm. Um but those were the big influences there. Um and then just other fun things are in there. There's the way that I draw the trolls, uh, the are, are drawn yes. by, they kind of look like dogs. Yes. That came from a, a weird memory. I'm not sure if I even share this with Haki. I remember a girl in like third grade or second grade showing me how she draws a dog. And it just had this wide nose and this mm -hmm. wide eye and stuff. And that always stuck with me. So I ended up drawing my trolls to look half dog-like, even though they're not really, I'm not even sure how much fur versus skin there is. Yeah. Just that open. Um, but again, that's all stuff pulled from the childhood. And then he ends up getting partnered up with this magical robot named BD BD. Uh, now, yes. obviously, that's kind of a play off of like, you've got like R2D2 and all of that stuff. Um, and I think you've, you've asked me about this in, in uh, 
earlier in an email, it is exactly from Buck Rogers in the 21st yes. century. You know, that little character, that robot character on the Tweaky. Yes. Ugly he would go beady beady. Yes. <laughs> Uh, so that's where the name comes from. It's like all of this is just reaching back into my formulative stuff. Uh, Thundar is a huge, ex- is a huge, huge influence on there. The Cracked Moon, mm-hmm. that's there from Thundar. Um, even Puka is kind of a stand-in for um, for Ukla, Ukla the Mock. You know, um, who then I actually draw in issue four. The, there's these Bigfoot-like characters that you see. Yeah, um, those yes. are very. Funny influenced by Ukla the Mock. Um, so it's it's all it all goes back to my childhood and I'm I'm just remixing everything, all my influences, and just hoping other people get it because I, I have luckily with Kickstarter, this is the beauty of Kickstarter, mm-hmm. I don't have to make these calculations like I have to if I'm doing something for the mainstream audience or an independent book that has to survive a dark horse or image. Yeah. Um, you know, throwing my aunt in there as a as a as a spirit guide, I have no idea how that's going to land with people, mm-hmm. uh, or if they'll understand it, or if it matters, or if it matters better that they don't understand it. Mm-hmm. You know, um, so yeah, this is just it. Really, is it's it's everything that's ever influenced me, getting mixed up into this. Hopefully, a unique experience. Um, because Mike, I'm gonna because again, like I've said, I've read all four issues, and also, sorry, listeners, I know you're gonna hear paper shuffling in the background um because i also in one of your kickstarters i got that um little um bolster spread and i want to say i think the story is called mother's sword it was oh, like, yeah yeah it, i thought that was so cool i didn't expect that you know it, um i think when i ordered um uh, when i back the kickstarter for issue number four that came with it. And I was like, oh, this is cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, one of, the, one of the incentives that we had was um, I did a poster with a two-page story, which I intended on doing more of, but like bandwidth got the best of me. Um, so it was a, it was just a two-page story kind of explaining the sword that she carries um, yeah. from her mother and that there's these, um, I don't, I guess they were evil beings, these spirits that were caught in her sword. Yes. When she, she, vanquish her mother vanquished evil beings they get stuck in her sword um but i wanted them to change so like they've been in there for thousands of years in her sword they witnessed not only the things that that they've done being trapped in with other horrible evil beings in the sword but they've seen the good things that that her mother had done with it over the years and then what una's doing with it mm-hmm. and at a certain point that the sword gets broken up open the yeah. spirit out and they've changed, you know. Um, this again goes back to childhood stuff. Uh, complicated religious crap. Like I remember asking mom about forgiveness and turning the other cheek and mm-hmm. complicated stuff I couldn't understand as a kid. And of course, you know, you ask these really hard questions and like, I don't know that it's true, but I'd like to think, I'd like to imagine, let's say this, I'd like to imagine that even the most evil of people are capable of change. Mm-hmm. Like, I don't know where that lands. I don't know yeah. what that means or anything, but in a fictional world, I can at least express that, 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 I, that idea in here. So like they choose when, when they're, when they're freed from the sword, they actually choose to go back into the sword to stay with Una yes. to, to help her instead of, Oh, I'm free now and I can go like, no, mm-hmm. they, they're you not know, the best. We want to change and we want, we want to help make things better. Mm-hmm. Um, so again, it's all weird stuff from childhood stuff that just gets thrown into this mix, and um, and then that's how it comes about. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm going to say because I-, I love that little two-page origin story mm-hmm. because because when I because after I read all four issues, I you know I decided to you know read the two-page story. So I'm like, oh, because it kind of um, it was kind of a nice. Um, yeah, it, it, because to me, it kind of sort of fit, I, I want to say either issue three or four, like um, when I think Una is talking to her childhood friend. Now, is it is it P- Peaky? You know, about yeah. the fairies and, you know, because I remember there was a scene where he's going, you know, are you, are you okay staying out in the sun? Oh, uh, yeah, no, yeah. So I'm going to have to poke on. And then she's doing the maps and all these fairies are kind of like, 
pulling the points either the map away and yeah I remember like one or two panels in that two-page story kind of showed that then all of a sudden then they start then you start going into talking about you know the sword and so forth and that was i thought that was that was a nice little um bonus to it nice. I thought a really fun um extra uh and and i wish i had bandwidth i i intended to, to keep doing more um but you know it's just it's just time is, is hard oh, i'm glad you brought it up too because as i'm putting together issue five i need to make sure that's <laughs> reprinted in there um i'm very good at doing the work uh everything outside of the work is, is hard for me um the production end is hard um you know um and i can lose track of things i'm really glad you brought that, that story up oh, yeah. uh, but it was a really fun incentive um and uh you know maybe we'll, we'll be able to this kickstarter is going pretty well so far so you know maybe for for the uh, stretch goals we'll be able to bring back some of these posters and stuff mm -hmm. and just have um off the cuff question before i ask taki a question um because correct me if i'm wrong because i think as of yesterday um it, you reached fifty percent of your goals. Is yeah, that and yeah, then, three a.m. We we were able to to break uh, halfway. Yeah, so and, you know, really, really grateful for that because that takes off some pressure. <laughs> and and, and the, again, listeners, I know when you guys listen to this, the Kickstarter will be at least like a week or two already into the campaign. But um, we're talking about this on September eighth already. The campaign has been, you know, it has been going on for four days. It's already reached fifty percent, which is very good. No, oh, thank you, thank. You. I got to credit a lot of that to um, Dan Brereton is going to be doing a cover for us. Um, yes, and mm -hmm. Dan's a beautiful artist and it has a, a really strong um, audience behind him. And then our friend Sean McManus helped me make this trailer. Um, this trailer yes. that made a trailer thing blew my mind, yeah. and mm -hmm. like I, I think that's a huge part of it too. It's just grabbing other people their, their attention. Um, mm -hmm. uh, this trailer was. Just such a blessing. I can't believe that Sean did this. And, I know. Um, it's it's amazing. He's he's a really great friend. Yeah. And a talented friend. Yeah. And then of course, you know, all the all the supporters who have been there from the very beginning. Um mm -hmm. I know one thing I am going the only the only sort of stretch goal thing I'm going to promise is I, I'm gonna do a sticker that basically is, says uh, anyone from issue one through five, even if you only supported issue five, you're an original Kickstarter. Um, supporter, like an original After Realm Kickstarter yeah. supporter kind of sticker, something mm -hmm. that that because I do plan on, like I don't know if I'm going to. So you're gonna do like instead of I voted, it's like I read it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So like what, whatever form or shape it takes place in the future, like this is really the foundation for everything else is these these five issues and and everybody who supported it and made it possible. Um, should feel some amount of ownership over it you know like i was there you know <laughs> that kind of thing yeah. that is pretty cool now um i am joking on this part it's an off-the-cuff question mike um and you can answer talkie too as well you've already mentioned about stickers are you going to make a sticker called um kyle's fart right because this oh, is that Crow farts. Farts. <laughs> farts. Isn't that like Una's? Isn't that Una's like catchphrase? <laughs> it is, yeah, especially as she was younger. Like I needed some. When I knew it, there wasn't going to be cursing. Uh, you know, when I when I pulled it away from that sort of heavy metal mm -hmm. thing, you know, and I always loved like that expression. You know, by Odin's beard yeah. and that kind of stuff. And for a while, I was going to have her say, um, "Stop the madness," because <laughs> I was watching Shark Tank, and I loved it when. And one guy would just say that was his dumb catchphrase, and for some reason I loved it. And luckily, Taki talked me out of it. And crow farts, uh, definitely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That should definitely be a, a sticker of some sort, some sort. I imagine it's smelling like berries. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it should be a scratch, a scratch oh and sniff. Uh, oh, wow. and it should smell like berries. I'll have to look into that. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um. Now, um, you know, um. Let's see. Um, actually, Taki, I'm going to ask you this question, and I'm not being sarcastic. Like, did you know? Um, like, because I know you and Mike work well together. You know, did um, Mike bounce off dialogue with you when he's trying to write? Like, if you get stuck with something, or I, you know, I, I you know, well, yeah, I gotta say, not a whole lot. Um, uh, like. I'll read his scripts. A lot of times, I'll 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 put my two cents in, but I try to keep my mouth shut. 
because I am uh I am notoriously like a, a harsh critic. <laughs> I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm extremely like um hard headed uh when it comes to um dialogue and stuff like that and uh you know and I keep telling myself like this is Mike's story this is not mm-hmm. my story so I I, I tried I I try to uh, stay out of his way as much as possible but yes we do rely on each other mm-hmm. and we we you know consult each other every yeah. step of the way or uh even if if like you know even like for my own project like uh and if he, even if he's not writing it I consult him all the time mm-hmm. Like does this work yeah. and stuff like that? Yes, and no. he does the same. So yeah, so yeah, absolutely. And we, we don't have any ego about it. Um, you know, we're just looking for the right. best. And like Taki's being modest, but she really is like my editor. She really helps me edit down. Mm-hmm. Um, one of the things that I've changed recently, because I learned from her at what, what she was doing with sleeping with st- standing, it's she set herself such harsh parameters to work within she's become a masterful editor in storytelling and getting to the point Mm -hmm. Uh, i was i had started to lean on dialogue and becoming too verbose Mm -hmm. one thing you do when you're writing a page once you have the beats out on your page like the the directions uh sometimes an easy way to write is to just write out whatever you think people are going to say Mm -hmm. and i started to lean on that that trick too much Mm -hmm. so very verbose and repetitive Mm-hmm. Um, sometimes you want to be repetitive for like a pacing kind of thing yes. um, but I definitely needed help on all that Taki was a huge 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 help in, mm-hmm. um, so it's not like I was asking her advice she just helped me just mm-hmm. cut a lot of stuff down and to stay focused I also had help with luckily we have a great circle of friends around us Brian Bendis, David mm-hmm. Mack, uh, David Walker and Sam Humphreys in particular was a huge help mm-hmm. with this first issues um, mm-hmm. I had Una wanting more than one thing and the phrase he was using is you can't ride a character can't ride two horses you know mm-hmm. and that's that really helped me focus in on on stuff and, and Taki's been a, a huge day-to-day editor on on helping me with the dialogue and mm-hmm. the story keeping it clear so yeah I don't really know what I'm doing at all but I, I don't know Ugh. why he listens to me <laughs> she's so wrong she's a genius she she has developed skills over time mm-hmm. um and I think it was this format that she chose for, for Sleeping While Standing. It, it, it made a huge leap for herself. Mm-hmm. Um, and as we started to, to study other writings, like we, we listened to the Alan Moore writing course mm-hmm. and um, loved it. And one of the things we loved about it was he was talking about like experimental writing, like try to write a, word, a sentence without the word the in it and see how far yeah. you get, what, what choices you're forced to make. And he would give examples of all these novels that were written short novels without like using the letter e or some crazy stuff right mm-hmm. and like it just sounds like a, like a show off exercise but it is not it, it's 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 an exercise in editing and and mm-hmm. rethink clarity yes. and how you look at this this object from a different point of view mm-hmm. um, Aki did that to herself this is before uh, we didn't listen to that stuff till afterwards but this is what she w- put herself through when she decided to tell complicated deep personal stories in four pages or less yes mm-hmm. and um all of our friends i mean we would we would show these to 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 walker and to bendis and they'd be kind of flabbergasted you know like what taki was able to do and uh, it's changed the way that i've written since since then uh, and i'm really excited for the stories i'm going to start writing for Athrealm afterwards because of this mm-hmm. um so it's just a style i mean uh, there's there's no right or wrong you know we hate talking about ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah but yeah but uh you know uh yeah there's no right or wrong and that's mm-hmm. that's what we need to remember it's yeah. like you know you, yes. you, you style and i don't always want to r- write so like to the point and precise and like yeah. quick i don't yeah. always want to do that but i did learn a lot from mm-hmm. doing that scanning yeah you know and yeah and it'll just keep going yeah all right now mike i'm gonna ask you you know like for the after run did you have some type of bible for your character and did you like draw out like a or sketch out a map or or have some um i you know like a rough draft of a map of the nine realms or yeah honestly i really really love world building that was one of the things i would love doing before i started a comic just tons and tons of sketches and i did a lot of sketches of, of una and the after realm 
but honestly between refiguring out how I wanted to write because I was in a writing rut um and then this this complication that came up where I had this other opportunity and I drew the younger Una stuff and then I had to marry those into each other um it really and it, I mean this in the best way it's a ship being built as it's sailing you know usually that sounds like a mess sometimes it feels like a mess but because of the nature of, of the kind of stories I'm telling, I, I think it's the best way to do it. I think if I thought too hard about things, mm -hmm. which was, was what tripping me up early on, I was thinking too hard about plot and explaining how this works yes. and explain how there you can't cross from this part of the world to another part of the world and explaining why. You're bush writing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I've learned to just write out in all directions. Mm -hmm. um, so it, 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 it forced this to come about in a natural way. Um, so yeah, I really didn't plan on it. You mm -hmm. know, and I think basically this first five issues will become that Bible. So oh. all the other stories I'm going to tell, like there are there are, are characters I introduce here um, and we know about who they are, but they're not the focus of it. We'll mm -hmm. return to them in the future. Um, so this this becomes the Bible of, of the, the whole thing. Oh, okay. All right. <laughs> um, you know, because, you know, I, I'm just gonna make a... Uh... An, a compliment is what I loved about the first four issues is I love the first two issues that it focuses on Una as a child, what happened when Ragnarok happened, why mm -hmm. she went on the ground. She had to literally be separated from her friend. And yeah. then from issue three to, and then she's trying to look for her friend. And then issues three and four, she's trying to find out what happened after you know she, afterwards yeah. and, still, and correct me if i'm wrong i think she's still trying to look for her friend is that correct yes yeah you know yeah yeah and that that all comes to a head in in, in issue five in the last issue um i won't say it's resolved or not resolved but yeah. like uh it, it builds up to, to issue five yeah all right um and that's the thing for my child is just huge amounts of separation anxiety almost all my stories have involved that in some way <laughs> But the but the other thing, what I love, and I'm and I, I sorry, I'm not, I don't take offense or anything, but but for me that was a very good hook because I could relate to that. Yeah, you know, yeah. It's like she's trying to look for her friend. It's like oh, you know, and it's not like oh well, you know, he's gone. Yeah, so it's, not, it's no, it's like no, they had a they have a very deep friendship. Yeah, and the other thing too is that. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, Una's mom didn't really kind of approve of her and Pika's, P Piki Piki's relationship, sort of, or something yeah. like that. Yeah, mm -hmm. you know, I, 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 I didn't want the elves to be perfect. I didn't yes. want her mother, who's like the leader and all that, again, to be perfect. Um, and this was another huge influence on me, which is Led Zeppelin. Uh, mm -hmm. And there's a song called... Uh, Oh crap! I'm, I'm, of course, I'm forgetting. Um, that's the way. Mm -hmm. And in the song, it's it's like, it's 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 a very light guitar sound. Sounds very medievalish, mm -hmm. uh, kind of vibe to it. And melancholy about how um, this kid and this other kid aren't allowed to play together anymore. Mm -hmm. um, the way it is. Mm -hmm. And in my mind, it was like there's a difference between the the elves in this world and the fairies mm -hmm. in this world, and even fairy like um not fairy like uh um like elves wood wood spirits mm -hmm. and they don't have the same set of rules and stuff and and una's mother realizes that the influence of an outsider like that can come back to um have a bad consequence you know kind of like any any culture is afraid of outside influences yeah. mm -hmm. um so that's where I, you know, that that's where that came from. And in fact, you can find some of those lyrics in those first pages. They're they're just taken right out of Led Zeppelin's "That's the Way." <laughs> wow, that's pretty nice. That's really nice. And and I think we've uh, all had that experience where your your mother or father or parental figure is telling you, you "Don't play with that kid." Yeah, and you know, kids, or you think that that kid's fine. You know. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. But the other the other cool. Sorry. I'm, I'm kind of going off track, but then before I get into my next set of questions, is, but Mike, I think what's really great is that, um, you know, like you said, you not only are incorporating 
things that form you, form your childhood of you know such as like you know the X Men annual and the New Mutants annual, Thunder the Barbarian. But I mean, you're really also grasping music as well too that influenced the story as well. Yeah. You know, and um, you know, and um, and I'm glad that you know, and 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 I, and I keep saying this, but thank you very much for letting me interview you guys because. I'm hoping listeners that are in, in our in our age group, you know, mm. will listen to this and go, oh my God, you know, I didn't, so Una's last name Lightfoot came from Gordon Lightfoot. You know, oh, yeah. you know, the, in the first page of issue number one, it's a song, you know, these are the lyrics from a Led Zeppelin song I remember listening to years ago and it just brings yeah. back, it just brings back. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. Nostalgia. Yes. <laughs> yeah. You know, and what's really nice is that, Mike, is that um, for it, it, the music part, you're just touching on it um, kind of almost like on an a, a, uh, unconscious level for us, you know, for us, you know, for us in our age group. Yeah. And it's great. Oh, thanks. Thanks. Yeah. yeah. I mean, and I want it to be something like, hey, I don't want to get sued. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, B, I don't want it to call attention to itself. Yeah, you don't want it to be nudge, nudge, wink, wink. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, yeah. Of course, B, get it, get it. <laughs> get it. <laughs> and, and before we started, you know, before we started recording, um, you know, listeners, you know, I talked to Mike about, my God, man, I remember hearing, you know, Gordon Lightfoot back in the 70s. Mm. And just for that nostalgia, you know, talk, as you mentioned, just for that nostalgia, it was like, Oh my God! I have to go and you know I I googled on YouTube, you know um, a Gordon Lightfoot song. You know, I was like, yeah. and I listened to um, if you could read my mind because that was one of my favorite songs from the seventies. But it, it's been so many years, yeah, because yeah. I've heard it. And matter of fact, I even forgot his name. <laughs> He's still touring. Um, oh I, I'm. Yeah, yeah I, I I I hope he gets out to the northwest again because uh, last time this year, just scheduling wise, I couldn't I couldn't make it. Um, but I I I I'm really hoping I could see him. Um, yeah, he's still out there. He's still he's still got it. Wow, yeah, that's incredible. Really but I think you know what's pretty cool is that it's um his music style is he's not, and this is not a strike against performers today or anything, but it's just him and his guitar. Yep. He's just standing yep. there, you know, and I don't know, it's just something about the lyrics that just grabs you. Absolutely. You know, yeah. Because he's when a I, storyteller. Mm -hmm. He's a storyteller. You know, that's that's why it's compelling. That's why it sticks in your head. Yes. Yeah. Okay. I'm sorry. Okay. So I'm sorry. <laughs> let's keep we gotta keep moving on. Sorry. Um <laughs> now um I'm gonna ask you. Either one, actually, Taki or even Mike, you know, after four successful campaigns, what were some of the fans' reaction to the series so far? Um, positive. I mean, they're all positive, right? I mean, okay. yeah, yeah, I, I think, you know, yeah, I don't know. It's it's such a you know what one of the tra what I thought was a trade off in my head, right, was a smaller audience for uh, a guaranteed publication, yes. right? Usually I'm just trying to, just desperate to get as many people as possible to, to buy the book. Cause when you're doing creator own stuff, it's typically off of a royalty based thing. Mm -hmm. So you don't know if you're gonna make any money at all. Yes. Um, so there was a safety net here and knowing we would recoup uh, our time, right? Mm -hmm. And I thought that having a less, a smaller audience was going to be a, a lesser than experience. And it totally has not been, um, you know, hearing from people who have not just saying stuff like, it's not just on their read pile, like everything else. Mm -hmm. They go, yes. oh, cool. You know, they, they are so appreciative and, and observant about the story. And I hear more in-depth reactions to the stories than I do for anything else that I do. Anything. Because mm -hmm. um, they're invested. Yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And we've made, you know, online friendships uh, with people who have been backers on the books. Um, like this guy, Mike Plavin, Plavin, um, this guy, Rick, I talk to all the time on Twitter. Mm -hmm. 
just start to get to know people and like even when you screw up and like somebody's package gets lost mm -hmm. they're so patient <laughs> yeah or people that i've just i've just dropped the ball several mm -hmm. times right? it takes a long time not for everything to get out but one person's order one person's special thing can either get lost or there's a problem yeah. everybody is so patient and mm -hmm. understanding yeah. it. It, it, it's 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 a completely different experience than everything else and until you've done it you can't really ex ex explain what it's like and um i'm super grateful for it and it's humbling in all the best ways definitely mm -hmm. yeah yeah you you um you drop all the the middleman uh, yeah. between you and the reader you yeah. know so yes there's a lot yeah. more we have to do in yes. order for this to happen yeah but you know yeah it, it, you get it directly from us so yeah there's no um you know uh bookstore or a uh, publisher mm -hmm or um distributor or any yeah. any, any any people in, in between yeah um, we, we do have help that i want to um call out to is um yes. yeah uh, jeff mccomsky he's another kickstarter guy he's got several of his own books um he's a great kickstarter campaign guy and he helps us with our fulfillment he helped walk us through how up uh, mm -hmm. uh you know the kickstarter um like i said our bandwidth is super super tight between work and health stuff and without Jeff we just wouldn't have been able to do it or, or get these books out or anything mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so you just kind of like the kickstarter funders help with everything happen you know, Jeff is one of those people behind the scenes and our letterer as well you know um Sean Lee yeah uh, he, he does all the technical stuff that I don't I know I don't know how to put together a, a complicated pdf you know mm -hmm. <laughs> so without Sean and his amazing lettering uh, you know there's lots of stuff I just wouldn't be able to do right absolutely yeah Takes a lot to bring a comic together. <laughs> <laughs> All right, now we've now we've come up to the After Realm issue five. You know, already listeners already the campaign is in full swing. And Mike, I'm going to be honest with you. This is a dumb question without spoilers. Can you tell listeners what issue five is going to be about? Issue five steps into a what I think is sort of a brand new mythology, um, mm -hmm. at least for me, it's it's the American mythology. Yeah. Um, so yeah. on issue four, there's a big American flag, so it's not too much of a, of a giveaway. Uh, yeah, she steps out into uh, what's left of the American spirit. You know, mm -hmm. it's not a physically literal America anymore because everything's gone, mm -hmm. um, the chunks that are left. And she'll meet what I feel are like some of the, representations of the foundation of america good and bad mm -hmm. um, yes so there's some imagery of like there's some gun gun imagery mm -hmm. it represents a lot of things that you know without even saying it you know what these mm -hmm. things can be. going back into our history uh there's a circus imagery the circus mm -hmm. of what sometimes we can be mm -hmm. uh, there's an american eagle mm -hmm. imagery which yes. represents up the positive stuff and there's these other characters that represent a lot of things and i'm trying to really be careful because of you know they mean so many things to different people yes uh, and uh hopefully i'm i'm saying something without being too heavy-handed about it in the end yeah and we get to explore these the iconology of america and w what that means for una going forward you know because yeah. as she's discovering quote a new world mm -hmm. this was a new world that was already discovered you know quote discovered mm -hmm. you know and what happens to that old world? What happens to that new world? What happens to both of them after both of them are gone? Mm -hmm. So yeah. it's treading over all this territory. And so hopefully it's it's not too heavy handed, um, mm -hmm. but it's there. It's, a, it's another way, hopefully an interesting way of looking at America, mm -hmm. not, not simply a, a negative or an overly positive way. It's just an objective way of yes. looking back when America is done. Mm -hmm. You know, what, what are the things that's left? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, and then Una comes to, to resolutions about certain things, and um, it really opens up the world at the end of this to to all the stuff I'm really really excited about doing. Mike, I'm sorry, I'm going to go off the cuff here, um, because you, I know it was kind of foreshadowed in issue number one that there was one of the trolls that looked like, you know, it looks like a huge, um, of course, like you said, the troll sort of looked like almost like a this brutish dog. But the cool thing I remember just seeing the image of one of them holding out like a Tommy gun. <laughs> yeah. Holy cow. That's 
And you know what that reminded me of? I don't know. Um, Ralph, I, I want to say, hopefully it's the right movie I'm looking at. Um, Ralph Bashke's The Wizard. Absolutely, yeah. Because I mean, the I, second cover is, is Una on this, on the, the her, her ostrich character, right? That's directly off of The Wizard's cover. Oh my God, that's right. <laughs> oh, yeah, that guy with the mask. And, he's, and that's when it was going to be also, that goes back to like that heavy metal and, and a lot of Bashke stuff was, was part of that. You know, it had all this crazy, like footage from World War II was, yes. was, was there, you know, um, you know, so I kept some of that, but, but in a way that I thought was, was more palatable and, and you know, uh, but yeah, that's definitely from uh, Ralph Bashke's Wizards is a huge influence on this as well. That, that's exactly your, about that, that is, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I was going, oh my God, this is so cool, you know. <laughs> ah, this is your target market. Yeah. <laughs> 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 all right um because and if i remember correctly i think from the kickstarter where the kick your kickstarter campaign issue five completes the first story arc um so like i'm just asking how many volumes do you have planned for this series about my plan is just to keep going um now i don't know publishing wise exactly what my plans are going to be i don't yeah. know if i'll continue to do all of these as kickstarters um i do know what i'm going to do is the next sets of stories you're going to start seeing like everybody will get this is you're getting a scoop here mm -hmm. oh no uh, thank you they'll all they'll all be free initially so i'm going to be putting them in my newsletters um bigger versions will be on my my uh i have a very modest patreon page which is i just put up like large size imagery there's mm -hmm. no real behind the scenes stuff it's just kind of like poster size stuff right mm -hmm. um so i want to do the short stories on my own time, yes. um, put them out that way, uh, which will continue to expand the, the universe and explore the stories. The next one is her running into Medusa. After that, I'm going to try to get wildly outside of the like, Greek and, and, and Norse yeah. stuff, which I'm leaning on a lot. Um, but they'll be in my newsletter um, and no charge. There's no paywall. Um, and that will also help me make sure I get my newsletter out more because I'm horrible. I'm only good at doing the work. I'm horrible about talking about the work, promoting mm -hmm. it. So I figured at least this way, it gives me deadline motivations to get mm -hmm. stuff out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Then the stories will be compiled and I'll either do those as uh, um, Kickstarter straight to trades mm -hmm. or, or some other way of actually putting them physically together. So I'm not quite sure yet, but mm -hmm. the good news is more stories and they'll, they'll be free for everybody and, and you guys will be in on the, the ground the ground floor and hopefully like it'll be it'll feel more um frequent yeah because it will be more frequent mm -hmm. yes. in small yeah more frequent in smaller bites yeah oh yeah that yes that yeah that'd be good yes um now um you know for listeners who have not picked up an issue of the after realm because these are thick issues. How many <laughs> pages are they? I, I went and wrote those down this morning. So issue one was 46 pages. Uh -huh. Issue two is 50 pages. Issue three is 48. Issue uh -huh. four is 40 pages. Um, and right now, issue five is, is coming in at 32, but it's not really finished yet. So yes. um, so you get a huge chunk of story for for, yes. for your investment. Yes, because it, it was great it was just like and, and again i and you know i'm not putting down other creators who you know do, do the kickstarters and just only because it's time yeah. and effort and stuff but but when i got that first issue it was like oh my god this is <laughs> nice. I, it's a it's a very nice good it's a complete story well not a complete story but i felt like i got my money's worth through the kickstarter uh. That's good. Yeah, you know, and I, you know, and I'm aware that you know, with Kickstarter, this is the way it's modeled and stuff. You just you do have to charge a premium price, so I, I want to make sure that people get like a really good meal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. And then, um, let's see. Um, and then, are you able to talk? Well, um, are you able to talk about um rewards, rewards tier? Well, you already talked sure. about sticker, a variant cover. Yeah, um, I'll, I'll keep it fairly simple. We've got a, a bunch of rewards, but instead of going over every little detail, um, you can get every issue in the add-on section. So if you if you buy um, a, a, a single physical copy of issue five, then through the add-on sections, you can get any single issue you might have been missing. 
We also have all five issues are available um, to, to order. So you can get basically the whole story at once now. Yes. I have two different covers for myself. Um, this is one of the wonderful things about Kickstarter. So I had two or three versions of the cover and, and I was stuck on what I liked best. Mm -hmm. um, there's the version that's better for the story, for the aesthetics of what the book is. Mm -hmm. And then one I liked better because it just was fucking cool. Pardon me. Mm -hmm. It was just really yeah. cool. Oh, all right. yeah. <laughs> that's okay. It's so okay. The, the, well. my, yeah, so my main cover is the one that is appropriate for the story. And then there's a B cover, um, which is the one that's quote cool. Mm -hmm. uh, or whatever um it doesn't really make it's sense closer to your heart yeah 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 um and those are 15 those are the regular covers and then the incentive mm -hmm. covers by dan brereton and that'll be 20 dollars mm -hmm. uh, you can also get our back issue um incentive covers which are done by elsa chartier um yes. and uh phil hester did issue mm -hmm. two and um so you can buy all, all all of them in different combinations and stuff um and we also have uh, original artwork up for sale Oh, um, okay. that's also the add-ons yeah yeah um, and then the fun add-on is i've got the the for people who have missed the earlier kickstarters you can buy the uh bookmarks and i did a powers sticker sheet mm -hmm. um, okay. and the, and, um but but i kept it pretty simple just for the sake of of sanity <laughs> yeah. well, yes yes because there's already just a wild combination of like you can get you know individual issues or all five issues or there's the issues yeah. with PDFs and like once you start getting into that, like it, it's it's it can it can get complicated and hard to make it really clear for customers, you know. Yeah, no, it was looking like the menu from uh, Cheesecake Factory. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I look yeah. at that their menu and I'm like, yeah, I'm done. I mean, I just, it's just too many uh, to choose from, so forget it. Yeah. <laughs> Four pages. I love that. I love that. <laughs> one of the fun ones is too, and this was something that Jeff had taught me early on, was to do a, what's called the vault. Uh, so basically it's five issues of um, random comics that I've done over the years, my comps basically, uh -huh. that I signed. So you'll get five random signed comics and it could be anything from Powers to Dick Tracy to uh, Midnighter, which is just some Midnighter stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a great way to, to share stuff with people and for people to get something signed because um, I don't do many conventions, pretty much not at all. Mm -hmm. uh, and I don't get out there physically very much. So uh, it's a fun way to get get a little extra. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's pretty cool. All right, I'm slowly wrapping things up. Sorry, I didn't mean to take up a lot that's of okay. time. No problem. Okay, so Mike, I'm going to start off with you first. What did you um, enjoy or love the most about doing this series the after realm it's so self-indulgent you know I, I even with powers and and um the the creator own work that taki and i've done together on like rapture and synergy or mm -hmm. um, takio or any of these other books you know we're, we're still curating them for a mass audience and, and this whole experience has been like this discussion just talking about how, i even i didn't realize how much i've been pulling from my experiences growing up and put into the story yeah um that and working with taki and, and us discussing story we have like what we call the morning podcast where we just we end up talking about stories like for an hour. and why and how and all this stuff mm -hmm. what works what doesn't work and stuff like that pretty much every morning yeah 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 um and then like i said the surprise of having a smaller I, I don't want to use the word loyal, but, uh, but just a smaller party of an audience. Mm -hmm. you know? um, that experience has, has shocked me in a way that I, I never saw coming. So, yeah, it's just that. Getting to do things your own way. You know, you're mm -hmm. building yes. my imagination and I'm sharing with a small group of friends and and um, people who I can count on. You know, there have been, there've been Kickstarter supporters who have helped me in other ways, you know. Mm -hmm. um, whether it's with advice and stuff like that or oh you should check this thing out and just uh -huh. striking up casual friendships with people and yes. uh, yeah because we, we live a super isolated life you know part of which is by choice part of which is like health part of which is the work mm -hmm. um so this, this is a great way to have a community mm -hmm. hockey what about you what is the thing that you love most about doing this series with mike um, I'm just honored that he uh, lets me be part of it because I do love that uh, world and I love mm -hmm. the characters and I love the story. So I love that I get to be a part of it and, you know, 
all to come come together. Mm. Yeah. Thank you very much. Oh, all right. Welcome. I'm slowly wrapping things up. Um, let's see. Mike, I'm going to ask you a fun question. Taki, you can jump into. You guys already know what the question is, but now you've already, Mike, you already talked about your love for Thundar the Barbarian cartoon. <laughs> if IDW should call you after they listen to this amazing interview, and you can, <laughs> okay, um, if they call you, say, hey, we have a, we have the Thundar the Barbarian license. You, you know, we want you to do the comic. You know, right draw, talk, you can color. Do you have a story pitch ready for them? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I've had one for like 20, 15 years. I think we were, we were talking with the company a while back and um, it was something we were going to develop and then kind of, uh, like a lot of projects, sometimes they just get to derailed or whatever. But yeah, you know, I would, in a second. That is <laughs> No hesitation, right? All right, you ready? <laughs> yep, I, I'm up. I'm up for anything. Absolutely. Yeah. That is cool. That'd be so cool. Either, either <laughs> one could write it or a talk you could write it and you draw either way. <laughs> All right, talk. I'm going to ask you this question. Um, what is the most fun or exciting thing that you love about working in comics? Um, I guess the food. <laughs> 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 okay, you're gonna have to explain that a little bit more. <laughs> in the green room at, at a convention, just make the beeline for the donuts. No, I, I, um, what I love about comics is is about storytelling. Uh, what I love more than anything on this earth, besides my husband, is um, visual storytelling. I, lo I love visual storytelling in film um television comics mm -hmm. i i love it through and through and uh what comics does best is visual storytelling and i mm -hmm. love it so so much mm -hmm. so i love every aspect of it you know now that i've done all of it like i've done the writing i've done the yes. art i've done the colors i've done even done the lettering now mm -hmm. so i i i i you know i feel like i understand at least like I'm not a master of any of them, but mm -hmm. I understand all all of the aspects of like m making a comic. And um, with each step, there's a opportunity to tell a story and add on to it. You know, from writing to drawing, you can add more. And then yes. with that, you add more of uh, depth to the storytelling with colors and then you add more depth with with lettering and it's just yeah. it's overwhelmingly cool and because it's comics like you have a lot of that under your control mm -hmm. i i can only imagine that you don't have that kind of control in film and tv yeah. uh, you know so that's that's a really cool way to like uh tell a story so yeah that's uh, that that's the aspect i love is the storytelling yeah yeah for me it's basically the same it's 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 about the work the work mm -hmm. itself is so rewarding the work itself is such a blessing um it's why i'm not great like i mean i have i i do promote my work you know but it's usually i just link to links and stuff <laughs> like that i'm not good at talking about process or you know behind the scenes stuff or anything like that mm -hmm. like i even when it comes out like i don't even really look at the work when it's published mm -hmm. you know i, I mean, look at it to see what's wrong with it you know like all artists <laughs> mm -hmm. but um, it's it's about it's the only time in my life I can really be in the moment is when we're creating our stories um and it's to me it's it's why I I, I want to work every day you know I, I work like seven days a week mm -hmm. mostly because I want to um yes. I really really just love whether it's drawing a page or writing story or talking about stories with Taki and, and our friends Mm -hmm. um we'll watch stuff and as a show falls apart some of our favorite times is just talking about well why did it fall apart mm -hmm. you know what yeah. up so well and what happened here um and then it's you know it's such a harder puzzle when you look at your own stuff because you're building it from scratch mm -hmm. you know so yeah that's it's basically the same same thing with Taki and, and the fact You're that I get this shit. Cat. Yeah, I'm a copycat. <laughs> I'll just take her answer. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> same thing with lunch. I'll have what she's having. 
<laughs> All right, I'm slowly wrapping things up. Um, Mike, I'm going to ask you. I'm going to start off this question. What is your? And I know you said that you know you guys don't do too much conventions and so forth. But, um, but what was your favorite convention moment? Whether it was either as a fan or as a creator. Guessing when Taki picked me up physically at Chicago Comic Con and with like drunken rage, it was pretty good. Rage? <laughs> well, that had to be the strength that you had to have to physically lift me off the ground. Oh, wait no. a minute, you, wait a minute. You physically lift Mike up. Okay. Oh, yeah. And Brian. And Brian. <laughs> <laughs> Independently, I, yeah, uh, it was the first time I met Mike, or no, Brian. Mm -hmm. And, uh, he knew me he knew about me because i was on his uh message board mm -hmm. yes and yeah so he's like hey i know you you're talking soma and i was like hey nice to meet you brian come here i'm, I'm gonna pick you up <laughs> and i picked him up and then there's an actual photo uh uh evidence of this <laughs> uh, you know, interweb holding brian like a baby yeah I'm holding him up and then uh the second time I met Mike, I met Mike uh, in uh, Florida. Yeah. Probably like a few months prior. Yeah. And that time he just challenged me to a fight, but it was. Yeah, I, I did challenge him <laughs> to a fight um, because, you know, I was really strong back then. <laughs> um, but yeah, and I hit Mike up too. And uh, that, yeah, that was, that was probably my favorite uh, yeah. convention. <laughs> okay. I th I couldn't believe how strong I was. <laughs> I'm five foot three, and uh, you know, yeah, I, I I don't look like much, but I was really really strong, and I liked showing off how strong I was. So yeah, yeah. but that that's the main thing we miss about cons is that the people you know, other other professionals, other fans that you would kind of only see during mm -hmm. those stuff. Like, you know, it's 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 a that's your typical answer, but it's the people. No, yes, no, it's yeah, but that no, it. Thank you very much. And Taki, I'm going to say, I again, I know you guys, you know, don't do conventions too much. But if you guys ever come to Hawaii, mm -hmm. the whole, you know, for a convention, Hawaii fans will feed you good food. Nah. <laughs> no, we do. We do. It's, yeah. Uh, it was some of the best food we had out there. Oh, yeah. yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. And that's going to lead up to the next question. But I mean, because, you know, people bring malas, malasadas to you. And for listeners, malasadas is uh, is a Portuguese donut. It's, it's, you know, you have to eat it nice, fresh and hot and sugar on top. I mean, mm. we've, I've seen fans bring up, you know, you know, um, <laughs> you know, malasadas to creators, to uh, oh, celebrity no. TV stars. Um, you know, it, it um, the, you know, um, I've seen fans bring up, um, I've seen fans bring um, the box of um, Hawaiian host chocolate macadamia nuts. Oh, you know, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Oh. So, okay. Mm -hmm. So now this is a nice segue to the next question. Have you guys been to Hawaii? Yes, we have. We've mm -hmm. been to Hawaii, uh, Maui, and Kauai. Yeah. Several times. Well, Kauai once, and yeah. Maui and uh, uh, Oahu several times yeah yeah, yeah we, i was lucky with um when i was working at, at valve um mm -hmm. that was go to place they it was a beautiful place to work um and they treated everybody great mm -hmm. uh you know i know video games have had a lot of bad reputation of like how they treat and drive people and stuff but valve was amazing yeah mm -hmm. and one of those amazing things was uh vacations and they would take us out there and some of the best experiences we've ever had was wow. there one of the mm -hmm. things that stands out most was um we did that crazy drive around the cliff um and, oh, and, and the, the the road to hana yeah yes. and you know we're, we're having panic attacks and stuff we're seeing helicopters flying beneath us yeah and then we see like this uh this house selling um a banana stand or selling oh. uh banana bread yeah yes and we just stopped there and it was just one of those things really little just us and our friends and we just had this experience of this homemade bread in the middle of this crazy long trip and it was like for all the meals that we had and the touristy cool stuff we did, diving with turtles and all the stuff you expect, like that was one of the best experiences. Yeah. That's the thing that stands out. Yeah. 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 Oh, I agree. It was yeah. so great. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Final question. Mike, I'm going to start us off with you. 
Any closing words to our listeners? Well, your host here is really good. You should continue <laughs> listening to his show and contribute to his Patreon. Um, these were great questions. He made me think about things that I haven't thought about, about my own work here. Um, so I, I'm going to go back with issue five as I wrap it up with a lot of this stuff in mind. I'm thinking about how to better communicate with people about where this stuff came from, because often I forget. Mm -hmm. For me, it's just about the work, but I know that I, I know that readers want a little bit more than that. And uh, you're helping me connect to that. So I, I thank you for that. And um, and just thank you to all the Kickstarter supporters. I can't mm -hmm. express what an amazing experience this is. I've had a lot of um, opportunities in comics to do all kinds of big stuff. Um, it mm -hmm. doesn't really match up to, to this. And it's a really unique working. experience, yeah. for sure. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I, I, I have to echo your enthusiasm for Jason being such an amazing host. Yeah. I think this is like really fun. You did a lot of like research and like you kind of knew all of the uh, yeah. like uh, the hidden uh what you call it like stuff that the was subtext, in, yeah. yeah the subtext <laughs> in in the in the story. So that was pretty cool. Yeah. No, I'm no. Oh, thank you, thank you. <laughs> oh, thank, thank you for the kind words. Just thank, just you know. Um, I just want to thank you guys. Just thank you oh. very much for your time. Of course. Just, no, thank you. This was really, really fun. Yeah. Thank, thank you very much. Um, thank you for giving me the opportunity to interview you guys. Thank you very much. I wish you guys all the success with the After Realm issue number five campaign. So, yeah. Um, thank you. Oh yeah. And then Taki, thank you very much. Thank you very much for setting up this interview. Thank, thank you. Yeah, thank you for your patience. Um, so listeners, I'm going to say because I kind of sort of bugged Taki. I think I bugged Taki about a month, no, and sometime in August. And then I saw <laughs> on my email about oh the After Realm Kickstarter is going to start up soon. I'm like oh you know, and then I kind of like had to email her. I kind of bugged her again. So thank you very much for your patience. Yeah, no, <laughs> thank you. Not, 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 I, I you. read my emails and then I assume I'm going to get back to them and they immediately get buried in other things. So I'm glad Taki's there. It's, it's one of the things yeah. she, we help each other out a lot. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. But my don't, yeah, I know because I yes, I I I'm a little bit behind on some of my emails too. <laughs> <laughs> But you're not the only one. <laughs> oh, I think we all fall under that category. Because yeah. <laughs> I, I do, actually. So, yeah. <laughs> all right. Now, if you are a new comic book reader or a lifelong comic book reader who loves mythology, who loves, you know, fantasy stories, please check out the After Realm Kickstarter. Now, the campaign is currently underway and will end on Sunday, October 2nd. Now, I'm also going to add this as well to... Um, you know, I've already read the first four issues. I love it. Um, Mike, I'm going to, Mike, and I'm going to say, Taki, you know, you guys pour your love out in the you know, in this series. It really shows. You know, mm. um, you know, listeners, you know, as we, you know, um, you know, when, when you, when you read the After Realm, I mean, literally, you know, like I've said, it, it hooked me in already on page i can't remember three or four i'm going oh my god you know the troll that's holding the tommy gun it reminds <laughs> me of an image from the wizard so all these subtexts it, it kind of um pulls you in and mm -hmm. and it, it subtly pulls you in and it's great oh, um, thank you no thank you mike thank you for <laughs> thank you very much. thank you guys thank you very much I also want to thank Drew, the co of Comics for Fun and Profit, for putting this episode together. Drew, thank you very much for all your hard work behind the scenes. And if you are a new listener, please check out new episodes of Comics for Fun and Profit that comes out every Saturday. And I want to thank you, the listeners. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you for listening to this episode. Until next time, guys. Aloha. 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 Jason's always asking who his next interview should be. As you guys know, he does a fantastic job of reaching out to these creators, their publicists, their pub publishers, various people coordinating these interviews and sharing them with us. And we appreciate it very much. But he's always trying to, to do more. He's always asking for the right mix to reach out for. So I'm opening it up to you guys. Just share. Share on our social media 
platforms, send us an email. Let us know who you want us to interview, what your dream interview people are or up and comers you'd like to hear from. Jason only has so many hours in the day and he has quite a schedule, but he'd, he'd love to hear your thoughts and any other feedback you have on the interview episodes. Thanks again for listening. We appreciate it.